Hey everyone, it's Blake here with ChessPathways.com, and today we're talking about the Nimzo Indian Defense. The Nimzo Indian Defense is a Queen's Pawn opening, white begins the game with d4, black plays knight to f6, taking control of this important e4 square, white plays c4, which is their most popular move in this position, gaining more space in the center, and now black plays e6, opening up this bishop, and after white plays knight c3, threatening to expand here now with e4 and taking the full center, Black goes ahead and pins this knight with bishop to b4. This is the starting position of the Nimzo Indian defense, which I think is one of the most interesting openings in all of chess. There's just so many different ideas that both sides can have here. For example, white is sometimes going to end up with doubled pawns after bishop takes knight, and that's going to give black the better pawn structure, but white might be compensated for that by their bishop pair, and by their central space advantage, especially after playing e4 and sometimes even f4, uh, depending on the variation. Another of black's positional ideas here, even if they don't succeed in giving white doubled pawns, is to simply exchange off the dark squared bishop before putting their central pawns on dark squares, for example with a later d6 and e5, just trying to make sure that all their pieces are good, they're not left with a bad bishop, and to fight back in the center that way later on. So those are some of the key ideas of the Nimzo Indian defense, and we're going to talk about how the game can progress from here, but first let's take a step back and talk about some move order issues in this opening. Going back here to move 2 after black plays e6, uh, so far we've only looked at white playing knight c3 and pinning that knight with bishop b4, there's a lot of players with white who want to avoid the Nimzo Indian, and they can do so by just not playing knight to c3 here. For example, knight f3 is a popular move, also g3 is sometimes played in this position. So the bad news is, if white does this, you're not going to be able to play the Nimzo Indian. You do have to learn another defense to play with black, in case white doesn't let you play the Nimzo Indian. But the good news is, in a sense, a move like this isn't as ambitious for white. White's not threatening to play e4 and take the full center, because your knight still has this square under control. So most Nimzo Indian players will do one of two things against this knight f3 setup. You can either play bishop b4 check anyways, which is called the Bogo Indian defense. It's a little different because, of course, you're not pinning that knight here on c3, but a lot of those positional ideas are going to be similar to the Nimzo Indian. You can still play d6 and e5 later on, so that appeals to a lot of Nimzo Indian players. Or there's also this move b6, the Queen's Indian defense, just taking e4 under even more control after bishop b7. This b6 move wouldn't be so great, by the way, after white does play knight to c3, because again, if you played b6, white simply is going to play e4 and take the full center. But against the knight f3 setup, b6 is totally playable. Of course, there's other moves here too. It's not too late to go back to a queen's gambit with d5 or a Benoni with c5. But if you wanted to play those systems, you probably wouldn't be playing the Nimzo Indian anyways. Uh, the Bogo Indian and the Queen's Indian are much more in the spirit of the Nimzo Indian. But okay, now that that's out of the way, the focus of this video is the Nimzo Indian defense after knight c3, bishop b4, so let's go from here and talk about how the game can continue. White has tried a whole lot of setups against the Nimzo Indian, we'll just cover a few of them in this overview video. Let's start by talking about a3. Not a very popular move these days for white, but it does illustrate well what can happen after white gets these doubled pawns. So this move is essentially forcing black to make good on his threat to double these pawns, because it wouldn't make sense to retreat now. So bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and now black's most popular move is to play c5, a very instructive move. We talked about how black usually wants to put these pawns on dark squares now that they've exchanged their dark squared bishop, and this move kind of freezes these doubled pawns, trying to turn them into targets. Of course, taking isn't much of a concern for black. Black would be down a pawn, but now white has tripled isolated pawns, and black's not going to have any trouble getting some of those pawns back. So to show one sample continuation, after e3, black goes ahead and castles, bishop d3. Black is often going to try to bring a lot of pressure against this c4 pawn. It's a doubled pawn, it can't be easily defended from behind, and there's some setups where black can even put this bishop on a6, put this knight on a5, and put this knight on d6 and really have all of their minor pieces aiming against this c4 pawn. But white can fight against this, white's going to try to take space in the center. So knight c6, knight e2, b6, e4, threatening to expand here with playing e5 later on, black will usually just get out of the way right now and play knight e8, because they know they might want to bring this knight to d6 anyway, adding more pressure against this c4 pawn. 
By the way, white develops this knight to e2 instead of f3 to leave the path of this f-pawn clear. White knows they already have doubled pawns, they want some compensation for that by grabbing a lot of space, and they're probably going to play f4 in most continuations. Castle? And now black develops this bishop, but they don't put it on b7. It doesn't do much there. They're going to put it on a6 and target this weak c4 pawn. f4. And now black often plays f5 here, trying to stop white's expansion here on the king side. It would be kind of dangerous to allow white to play a move like f5 and really get that attack going. So f5, knight g3, and now just g6, defending this f5 pawn. Bishop e3. White's adding some pressure here to c5, hoping to get black to exchange off on d4 and undouble these pawns. And black can either take on d4, or they can just play knight to d6, because if white takes this pawn, uh, then the c4 pawn is falling. For example, after d takes c5, knight takes c4, black is considered to be fine in this position. Black's not down any material, the white pawns are still kind of weak. If white doesn't want to move this bishop right now, then they have to give up their bishop pair advantage by exchanging here on c4, and the game is considered to be roughly equal. So I think this is a really good illustration of both sides' ideas and a lot of these doubled pawn setups. Black tried to bring a lot of pressure against this c4 pawn. White tried to really take a lot of space here, but black struck back with f5, trying to keep white's space advantage in check. White tried to add some pressure here to try to get black to undouble these pawns here with c takes d4, and the logical result of both sides fighting hard to impose their will on the position is this roughly equal result. Now it's good to know though, if your opponent doesn't play this way, it would be very easy possibly to get a very big advantage uh, if they don't play properly. For example, going back here after knight c6, if white doesn't do this, if white just plays moves like knight f3, and we play b6, and they just castle, and we played bishop a6, and they just keep developing like nothing's going on, we're just going to be able to play knight e8, knight d6, knight a5, and it's really going to be impossible for them to defend this c4 pawn, and they're really getting nothing to show for it here, because they're not expanding with f4 and e4, and really trying to put us to the test. I'm sure you'll see lower-rated players do this all the time, just finish their development because they don't understand the plans of the position, and you'll probably end up winning a pawn pretty easily here on c4. So just good to keep in mind not only what happens if both sides play properly, but also how you can exploit it if your opponent does not. Actually, it just so happens that in this particular position, after bishop d2, uh, d5 is even very strong. Now that this bishop is undefended, we can make use of this pin, and it's hard for white to keep all their material here. So that was that move a3, which isn't very popular because black sometimes wants to take here even without being provoked. So why should white waste a move and play a3 instead of continuing on with their development? So because of that, let's take a look at knight f3, and I pulled together a sample line here as well. After knight f3, black can strike at the center with c5, again putting some of those pawns on dark squares. b6 would be an alternative, that's a perfectly fine way to play too, almost like a queen's Indian defense kind of idea. Uh, but c5 is one of the main moves. And now after e3, black can go ahead and get castled. Bishop d3, d6, putting another pawn on a dark square. If white castles here, now that this knight's no longer pinned, black might decide that now is the best time to go ahead and double those pawns and take on c3. After white takes back, knight c6, simply preparing to play e5, and after e4, e5, this is kind of very instructive to see what black's going for here. If white exchanges this d-pawn for either one of these pawns, now we're left with these uh, these double pawns being isolated. That doesn't look so great for white. So instead, if they uh, if they close the center here after e5 and play d5, now after black retreats this knight, either with knight to e7, or sometimes even knight b8 and knight d7, either way, now the center is completely locked up here, and that really restricts the scope of white's pair of bishops. We know that the bishop pair usually likes the open positions, and knights are usually said to do better in closed positions, so black is hoping that their two knights might outperform the two bishops here. Black also has some ideas to maybe play for a pawn break later on, possibly with f5 on the king side trying to grab some space. And this is just kind of a nice pawn structure to have without the dark squared bishop on the board. You have all your pawns on dark squares. There's no dark bishop that that's really restricting. All the black minor pieces stand pretty good here. And these doubled pawns could remain a long-term liability for white. Of course, white is by no means doomed here. White can maybe try to play for f4 to open up the position some more, but this position is considered roughly equal as well. Going back here to move 3, 
Another option white can consider on move four is to play f3, simply renewing the threat to play e4 and really grab a big space advantage early on. Black has a couple options here. Black can certainly still play c5. And if white advances here with d5, trying to build this big pawn chain, black can even play this move b5 here, kind of Blumenfeld Gambit style. Except it's not really even a pawn sacrifice yet. It's hard for white to really win a pawn out of this because if they take on b5, then black would just get to take on d5, and that's not good for white. Instead, after b5, white could just continue by playing e4, just letting this bishop defend the c4 pawn. But now we see black's clever idea here. They can play b takes c4, bishop takes c4, and now knight takes d5. This surprising blow, because if the e pawn took, then there's queen h4 with a fork of the king and bishop. And we see that the, the king's short diagonal here gets exploited, and white uh, regrets playing f3. Like I always say, there's always going to be a downside to playing f3 or f6 in the opening. Even if the move's not bad, it's still going to have a downside. But white doesn't have to fall for this. White does not have to take here on d5 with the pawn and allow queen h4. White can take here with the bishop on d5. Then after e takes d5, queen takes d5, and knight to c6, we are left with this interesting position. For once in the Nimzo Indian defense, it's black who has the bishop pair here. And black might like to chase this queen away, but it's kind of hard to. That's really what white is kind of banking on in this line. White actually scores pretty well from this position, from what I can find. So instead of playing c5 here, a lot of players, when they're faced with f3, will go back into a more queen's gambit style pawn structure and just play d5. Really clamp down on this e4 square even more, because if white can't get this e4 move in, they're probably going to regret having this pawn on f3. It exposes the king, as we've seen and it takes away the knight's best square. So simply switching back to playing d5 makes a lot of sense after white plays f3. Just to show one sample continuation after d5, let's say white plays a3, trying to break that pin. Bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and now c5, striking even more at the center, trying to exploit the downsides of this f3 move. And for example, after a c takes d5, knight takes d5, d takes c5, white temporarily won that pawn, but we've seen that usually isn't a problem. The white pawn structure is very weak here, and after queen a5, both of these pawns are big targets, and it's not so clear what white has gained by playing this move f3. The position is considered roughly equal. Going back to our starting position here after bishop b4, queen c2 has become a very popular move to play against the Nimzo Indian, simply preventing those doubled pawns. Not only does the queen on c2 prevent doubled pawns, but it also watches over the key e4 square, so this is obviously a very logical move that needs to be taken seriously. So I've pulled a sample line to show how the game might progress here. Black could castle here. Black could also play c5 here, as we've seen previously. And in this particular line, white will often take here on c5. White could also play a3 and just force black to give up the bishop pair. Uh, but after bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, we see the queen has wasted a couple moves here in the opening. The queen's a little bit exposed here on c3. And black can play d5 here to try to exploit that and open up the center. For example, after d takes c5, even d4 is a possibility. So we see why the queen can be exposed here on c3. But white doesn't have to go for this. As I said, uh, going back here, uh, white can take here on c5 in response to c5. And this is going to lead to a different kind of position than we've seen before, where this bishop's probably going to have to take back here on c5 instead of taking on c3. Black doesn't have to take back right away, though. Black can castle, because white's not going to be able to defend this pawn. But after a3, black's going to take there on c5. And now just to show how the game might go from here, knight f3, b6. We've seen this uh, Fianchetto setup before. Bishop to f4, bishop b7, rook d1, knight c6. Both sides are simply getting their pieces into this game. e3. And now one idea black has to try to get some play is to play knight h5. And then f5, grabbing some space here on the king side. Both their bishops pointed this way, and black's trying to get some play on the king side. I have just one more example for you. Let's take a look at this move e3 here, and I just want to show another kind of way black can play in the center. Castle, bishop d3, c5, we've seen this before, knight f3. And here black sometimes plays d5, creating even more pawn tension here in the center. This is what I think makes the Nimzo Indian such a strategically complex opening. There's just so many different ways that both sides can handle the position. We've seen black go for the, the c5, d6, e5 structure. We've seen lines where black plays uh, c5 and d5, like this one. Uh, we've seen lines where this bishop has to take on c3. We've seen lines where the bishop has to recapture on c5. 
Uh, so let's look a bit further at this one. Castle, knight to c6. Here white will often play a3 and force this bishop to exchange off uh, for this knight. Bishop takes c3, b takes c3. D takes c4, bishop takes c4. That's why white wasn't afraid of the doubled pawns as much in this line, because after this pawn comes to d5, it's not going to be possible for white to be stuck with those doubled pawns long term. They can always opt to exchange off a set of those pawns and, uh, and avoid being left with those doubled pawns. But in this particular line, this is still okay for black. Even though white doesn't have those doubled pawns, black is going to be able to finish up their development. Queen c7, bishop d3, and e5, once again putting another pawn on a dark square. And for example, after queen c2, black can play rook e8 to reinforce that pawn, possibly threatening to play e4 and fork the bishop and knight. And black is considered to be doing fine here as well, even without white having those doubled pawns in exchange for white having the bishop pair. Just to show one idea, if white plays e4 here, trying to grab some space and stopping black from playing e4 themselves, black will often respond with c4. A nice little deflection here because if this bishop takes on c4, now black can win a pawn here in the center. This e4 pawn is going to be loose after black takes here on d4. And after white recaptures, uh, black could go ahead and take this e4 pawn, or black could even throw in knight to a5 in this position, uh, attacking this somewhat pinned bishop. And after black does take this pawn back on e4, white's going to be left with an isolated d pawn here in the center. All right, thanks for watching. I hope these examples showed you a little bit about how the game can go in a Nimzo Indian defense. Please make sure you visit chesspathways.com and get signed up, and I will send you a free move-by-move -move guide to chess thinking. I'm trying to help more players become masters, hopefully in a fraction of the time it took me. Thanks, and I will see you there.